The sixth generation of home consoles played host to a multitude of licensed games. With new leaps forward in technology and a wider base of players than ever before, thanks in part to the explosive popularity of the PS2, tie-ins to movies, TV shows and more were in great abundance. As the gaming press endeavoured to sort through them all, a trend of mixed to negative reviews set in. Time-restricted development cycles, often to meet movie release dates, led to many of these titles receiving receiving a critical mauling. Unsatisfied fans and critics fueled a stigma around licensed games throughout the 2000s, but occasionally some games managed to defy the norm, games such as The Simpsons Hit and Run. The press responded well to this driving centric open world adventure and it would go on to be one of the highest selling licensed games of the generation, with an enduring cult following. Regardless of its astronomical success, the title would mark developer Radical Entertainment's final game to use the IP. A sequel to Hit and Run never surfaced, despite an unrelenting outcry from fans spanning well over a decade. It was an acknowledgement of the continued reverence for the game that I went in search of the developers behind it. I spoke at length with numerous former employees from Radical to learn more about the history of their Simpsons games and why a Hit and Run 2 never materialized. In the year 2000, a new generation of consoles was beckoning, and the Simpsons license holders were in talks for their characters to star in a video game for this new hardware. Pictures were heard from studios all over the world, but it was Vancouver-based Radical Entertainment that managed to stand out from the crowd. Their proposal came about partly by coincidence. A small group at the company had been experimenting with an original driving game prototype around this time. When the studio learned that Gracie Films and Fox were looking to create a new Simpsons game, the realisation came that the property would be a natural fit for what they had already been working on. Former employees say this open-ended driving game of theirs came to life when mixed with the personality of The Simpsons. The player would provide a taxi service for the residents of Springfield, picking them up and taking them to a destination of their choosing as quickly as possible, a la Crazy Taxi. Radical saw this as a fresh angle for Simpsons video games, with a premise that enabled them to showcase a variety of different character interactions. Gracie Films agreed, and the game was soon put into production. It would become known as The Simpsons Road Rage. According to former Radical producer Vlad Seroldi, however, initial outlines for the game were far more ambitious than the final product. For much of its development, Road Rage had been set to portray a fully open world Springfield. Outside of 1997's Virtual Springfield, this was the first game to attempt to realise the whole town in 3D space, an undertaking which warranted constant back and forth with the rights holders. Players would have zipped all over the landscape seamlessly without loading screens as they ferried citizens from one side to another. Alas, this plan was held back by the technical limitations of one system in particular, the PlayStation 2. For the majority of development, Radical had experienced no such issues. They found that the PS2's development hardware could handle the large world they were aiming for, which had been almost entirely mapped out. But as the game's technical director Vlad Seroldi explains, problems arose when the retail PS2 units arrived with unexpectedly revised specs. The speed of the drives of the retail units were not as efficient or as reliable as uh, the dev units. So we could not get the data fast enough off, uh, off the disks in order to populate the world the way we had designed everything. So uh, a, little, a little early screw up on, our, on my part probably. Um, at the last minute we were going to go publish the game, we got dates and everything else, we had to redesign the levels uh, like crazy. These complications forced the developers to abruptly redesign the whole game in a short time frame, chopping it up into smaller levels to salvage its performance. The last minute changes left visible scars on the game's world, as the developers tried to account for why players could not continue driving along certain roads. Obstacles like vehicle pileups inexplicably block the player's path if they attempt to access a different region of Springfield. It was pretty compelling for that era of device. Pretty disappointing at the, the very last minute to realise it wasn't going to work as we had designed. 
This wasn't the only considerable change to sweep the game mid-development. According to game historian Andrew Bowman, its textures and colour palette were noticeably revised following feedback from Simpsons creator Matt Groening. Older builds of the game had a brighter, more cartoony look that was more in line with the show, but this was apparently not to Groening's liking, he wanted Road Rage to stand apart from the show and look more like a video game. These suggestions are further supported by the claims of some of the developers I spoke to myself. In earlier meetings with the license holders, it said that Radical had initially proposed basing the visuals of Road Rage around the Treehouse of Horror short Homer Cubed. The story depicted Homer entering a portal into another world where everything is rendered in 3D. This idea was soon shot down by Gracie Films, who wanted it to adopt a more original art direction. Similarly, some attempts to expand Springfield beyond what was seen in the show were also held back by licensor demands and time constraints. According to multiple former employees, the setting was once intended to be much larger and include more original gags from the developers. An example of this provided by Vlad Soroldi was a shop named Gnome Depot, a pun on Home Depot which was eventually cut. The Simpsons Road Rage released in 2001 on PS2, GameCube and Xbox to moderate success, enough for a follow-up to be commissioned. The working title for this project was simply The Simpsons Road Rage 2. The team was set on creating a direct sequel that would more closely follow the open world setup originally intended for the first game, as well as adding on foot exploration. Players could now exit their vehicles, allowing them to enter iconic Simpsons locales like the Quickie Mart and Homer's workstation at the power plant. As the scope of the game continued to balloon, it was decided that it would no longer be a numbered sequel and would instead become another original title named The Simpsons Hit and Run. By all accounts, the developers were aiming for new heights of fan service, cramming in as many references to the source material as possible. According to Vlad Soroldi, one of its producers, they attempted to establish what he describes as a cadence to the environments, in that players would regularly encounter a recognisable landmark or reference to the show as they drove about. They wanted to reward exploration by always having something familiar and amusing be right around the corner. Many of the developers I spoke to in the making of this video cited the studio's genuine love of The Simpsons for its success. Their reverence for the series was palpable enough that the Hit and Run team even named itself after a fairly obscure reference from it, Fishbulb. This was a nod to the episode In Mod We Trust, wherein Homer is startled to discover a mascot for a Japanese cleaning product named Mr. Spock seemingly using his likeness. He later finds that it is actually a blending of two other existing corporate logos, a fish and a light bulb. As Radical up their ambitions for this considerably larger game, they looked to other landmark video games for inspiration. Their platforming was influenced by Super Mario 64, their driving mechanics by Gran Turismo, and lastly Grand Theft Auto was looked at for exploration. The latter of those was such a key inspiration that employees would sometimes jokingly refer to the project as Grand Theft Auto internally. The development of Hit and Run in general proceeded with fewer hiccups than Road Rage. A more experienced staff meant a greater understanding of the hardware which emboldened them to try new things. However, some developers say that large parts of the game's story were reiterated over, leading to many hours of work being scrapped. Without warning, Gracie Films decided to revise the script partway into development, diverging from the initial storyboards Radical had prepared. According to Vlad Soroldi, the changes were substantial and led to a story that was completely different from their original plan. It wasn't just the rights holders who were second guessing the project either. Some of Radical's own workers were voicing doubts about its quality. There was a time where we, we weren't sure how it was going to turn out. That was probably about two thirds of the way through development. We had taken on such ambitious ideas that we weren't sure that what we were building was. Literally one of the guys said we're polishing a turd. 
Radical staff began to realise that more time would be required in order for them to deliver on their vision for the game. With deadlines looming, they met with publisher Vivendi Games to request an extension. They sought to delay the game, and to their surprise, Vivendi was receptive to their request, agreeing to push it back as to not compromise on quality. A further three months were granted, on top of the already agreed 18 months. For context, Road Rage was developed in only 11 months. The additional time allowed them to further polish their mechanics and pile on more detail to the environments, adding new interiors to buildings. You know, they were game to, to spend more money and more time, which was it's rare. You know, after we get those opportunities. Uh, we had very little time, but the team was pretty enthusiastic about the additional time and how we could use it. Uh, probably a bit freaked out too, if I remember, because it was pretty ambitious add-on to what was already pretty ambitious. One mantra that the developers of Hit and Run employed during its creation was that they wanted fans to get access to all of its content and minimise barriers to forward progression. As such, a hidden adaptive difficulty system was implemented into the game, according to Seraldi. If a player fails a mission a certain amount of times, the game will dynamically alter its difficulty in order for players to more easily complete it. They can also opt to skip missions if they fail them five times in a row. Radical's devotion to the project paid off for them. Favourable reviews and strong word of mouth among fans propelled the game to financial success when it was released in 2003. Over time, sales snowballed, well exceeding the expectations of both Radical and Vivendi. According to sources linked to the two companies, there had been some considerations for a portable version of the game on PSP, although these were ultimately shelved to focus on other projects. In the years since its release, the game survived through its avid cult following an active speedrunning community and petitions for sequels and remasters continue to thrive in 2019. Given its popularity, the lack of a follow-up has raised plenty of questions among fans. Multiple former staff from both Radical and Vivendi asserted that a sequel was indeed once being planned. A small number of developers at Radical were a part of these discussions, which began during the tail end of Hit and Run's production. Initially, these plans were seen as very tentative amid uncertainty over whether or not the first game would actually sell, as ex-Radical designer Darren Evanson explained. We all knew that Hit and Run was fun, but we didn't know how sales were going to go. Needless to say, in the month after we shipped, we were pleasantly surprised at how well the public was responding to the game, and it really fed into our enthusiasm. For some of us, making a sequel was a no-brainer because that's what successful games usually did. Recognise when there's something hot and keep providing it until people don't want it anymore. But people wanted it, so we were fully planning on giving them what they wanted. And to be frank, it's what we wanted as well. We understood the license, we learned how to work with Gracie. And if we spent up to two years making it, we could have had an absolutely wonderful experience to give to people. So we started planning and working under the assumption that something like this was going to happen. If these early considerations are any indication, Hit and Run 2's planned direction was simply to go bigger and better. The developers wanted to provide players with an even richer level of detail in its environments and an increased level of freedom. For my role, I spent it researching branching mission structures and mission variety, explained Evanson. I spent some time playing through GTA Vice City to learn how they set up their mission structure and was planning for Hit and Run 2 to have a similar structure. It was going to be a bigger game, but it was going to be less linear, and really let people explore a virtual Springfield. It felt like this was going to be the game that was going to be the biggest hit we'd ever worked on. One developer cited plans to add more unique interactivity to each playable character, allowing certain characters to be able to access areas that were off limits to others. Another former designer likened their ideas to that of the Lego games developed by Traveller's Tales in the 2000s thousands, in that kid characters such as Bart would have been able to perform actions that the adults like Homer would have not, and vice versa. For instance, the children might have been able to fit into smaller spaces that were too big for the grown-ups. According to a former producer with ties to Fox, Hit and Run 2 was under consideration as part of a potential multi-game deal between the licensors and Vivendi. The success of Radical's two Simpsons projects had excited Fox, leading to this ambitious rollout being 
being suggested. The multi-project partnership would have implied not only Radical, but could have also involved other external partners such as Stormfront Studios. They had been in talks with Vivendi to deliver an alternate take on The Simpsons as part of the aforementioned deal. Referred to by the developers as The Simpsons Adventure, this proposal transformed the town of Springfield into a medieval fantasy setting. Many of its iconic characters and settings would have been represented through the lens of this new twist, such as Moe's Tavern which became Ye Old Moe's. Neither this or Hit and Run 2 moved forward as talks came to a close. Don Daglow, the former CEO of Stormfront, commented on the failure of their proposal. It was a pitch where the end result of licensing and publishing decisions prevented the game from ever being made. It was like pitching a wedding service to a couple who decide not to get married. Everyone loves your plan, but the ceremony will go elsewhere. According to a producer involved in these licensing negotiations, the issue had proven contentious among the higher-ups of Vivendi. On one hand, their Simpsons titles were hugely successful. On the other, the costs of renewing the license and making these games were considerable. Some people at Vivendi viewed it as potentially risky to continue revisiting the same well and felt that it wasn't necessary for them to add more Simpsons games to their portfolio. The first hit and run was already forecast to continue providing a steady stream of revenue for some time to come. Meanwhile, they already had access to other popular franchises from entities like Marvel Comics that their partners could leverage, allowing them to diversify. Despite some internal division over the subject, Vivendi eventually declined to renew their contract with the Simpsons owners. The proposed deal that once could have brought four more Vivendi produced Simpsons games fell through. Two years after the release of Hit and Run, EA signed a contract with Fox to develop their own Simpsons title. They released The Simpsons Game in 2007, although it failed to reach the critical success of Hit and Run, and plans for a sequel were subsequently scrapped. For some Radical Entertainment members like Darren Evanson, the demise of Hit and Run 2 was a source of deep regret. For me, that will always be one of the best times in the industry. We were working with friends on a game we felt was fun, and seeing it succeed. It's really too bad it ended there. Evanson claims there were brief talks to instead develop an open world game in the mold of Hit and Run for the Family Guy license, but these suggestions were turned down by Radical's management and they began to work on other projects such as The Incredible Hulk Ultimate Destruction. For other employees, such as Vlad Soroli, this presented a welcome change from The Simpsons following five years of working with the IP. We had a lot of energy left. If they, if they had wanted to make another Simpsons game right away, I think we would have had uh, a lot of excitement. I was excited to explore some other IPs that were part of the Bendy. I was a Crash Bandicoot fan from the original PlayStation, and they had that property, and it had been not necessarily front and center in the public mind in a way that I thought it could be. So I myself was was wanting to work with that, and subsequently we did. In March 2005, following multiple successful partnerships, Vivendi bought Radical Entertainment out. Two years later, Vivendi Games merged with Activision to become Activision Blizzard. Radical was able to release several more games in the years that followed, such as the open-world action game Prototype. A sequel to Prototype arrived in 2012, but was unable to meet sales targets set by Activision. The publisher responded by dissolving Radical Entertainment and laying off the vast majority of their workers. The Simpsons rights are now owned by Disney following its acquisition of 20th Century Fox. For Hit and Run's developers, the continued calls for the game's revival stand as a testament to the team's passion and the quality of their work. Uh, it, it was wildly successful from our perspective at that time. And so yeah, people put their body and soul into trying to do everything they could in those three months to, to maximize our opportunity to create a great special product. And, and you know, we're still talking about it. So obviously the team did a great job of, of touching a nerve with fans as far as what they're hoping to see in the new game form. For more content like this, please don't forget to subscribe. You can support my research on Patreon like these kind people did. I've been Liam, and I hope you'll join me for another Game History Secrets.